Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mark, for such a, uh, a generous addition. Thank you, um, Valerie, uh, and everyone at the library for, for having me. Thank you all for coming. It's, it's nice to see so many of you here on a, um, on a Friday afternoon. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be here, and as a, and as a former Veldi fellow, um, as Martin said, it's an absolute pleasure to be, uh, to be back here. Uh, now, this is the point, given that I'm, you know, I'm out of my native northeast of England here, is where I would say that... Um, you know, it's wonderful to have travelled such a long distance to be here in this room, but I think compared to the moon rock, uh, the distance that I've travelled to be here this afternoon really is uh, quite tiny. Um, and I did feel actually that, uh, that you know, that, that when um, uh, my book on H.G. Wells finally came out, that it, it had taken an awful long time to get here, but it, it hadn't taken three and a half billion years. Uh, so again, by comparison with the moon rock, that makes me feel a bit, a bit better about myself. Um, it's uh, a particular pleasure to, to work because this is uh, this this very room is the nerve centre of uh, a global HG Wells studies, um, but it's also uh, a, a benefit and advantage to be working on HG Wells uh, in the United States rather than in the United Kingdom, because some of you may know Wells is mostly, if not entirely, out of copyright in this country, whereas he is still uh, in copyright. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the UK. This even makes a difference to the kinds of online resources that you can access uh, on HG World, depending on whether you're accessing them uh, here um, or back at home. And it, it does, it's always, I think, a bit dodgy to speculate on what an author might think if he were alive today. Uh, but given that HG Wells, uh, given HG Wells' views on universal access to free knowledge, he was in favour of it, and his views on national sovereignty, he was against it. Uh, I don't think that, that Wells would have found the situation uh, to be very satisfactory. But uh, fortunately, H.G. Wells is, is going to be out of copyright in the UK from 2017. And it's, it's as a result of that that uh, Wells Classics uh, invited me to edit uh, The First Men in the Moon. But actually, after, Martin asked me to come here and deliver a talk about the manuscript here. So it's wonderful that you, you got in first. Thanks very much. It's great to have those, uh, to have those aligned. Um, now, uh, the, the, the textual story of The First Men of the Moon is quite an interesting one, that Wells was really on, uh, on the up as a writer in the late um, 1890s. And uh, he was also uh, beginning to build a house. He designed a house to his own specification, and this was going to cost a lot of money. So he was, he was concerned to maximise the intellectual return that he was going to get on this book. So he wanted to have it serialised uh, in the UK and in the US, and then have it published separately again uh, as a book in the UK and in the US as well too, which you'll know, you know writers like Henry James uh, will have wanted to do. He wanted to maximise the value of this too, which has created, I think, quite an interesting set of problems for any editor um, of this uh, particular book. Um, I should thank, actually, to my uh, work on this manuscript uh, since I got here and before has been uh, greatly assisted by the, by the transcriptions and the endeavours and the archive here in Illinois, Charles Keller. So, and uh, it's Charles I must thank for, for pointing out to me that in the correspondence with... Um, with Wells' uh, agent, and they're, they're weighing up different US publishers for the American version of the book, uh, which was published over here by Bob's Merrill. Um, uh, one state along from Indianapolis, and Wells wrote uh, to, uh, to Pinker and said, um, I hope these people are all right, but Indianapolis is a damned queer literary centre. But you know, nonetheless, uh, Bob's Merrill passed the audition, and they did pass the, uh, the, the American edition, but it's, it's created two separate stenata for the text of... Uh, of, of, the, of the first uh, men in the moon, and the so-called, you, you know, normally the kind of definitive edition, the complete works of H.G. Wells, the Atlantic edition, tended to take as copy text the American edition uh, rather than the British edition. Now, this gave me various kinds of problems when I was editing Kips for Penguin Classics, because a lot of the dialogue in Kips is written in phonetic Cockney, and the poor kind of, you know, 1920s American typesetters were kind of looking at this, and you lots of apostrophes in the, are in the wrong places. It um, presents a different uh, set of problems for the US edition, because at one point, when the US edition was being set, uh, an extra page was turned over by accident, unfortunately, in the middle of a sentence um, that made grammatical sense. So there are a lot of American editions of The First Men in the Moon that have an entire missing chapter, that, is, that the chapter was deleted to try and, and, and make sense of this. So, um, so this is why the, the, you know, the next edition of The First Men in the Moon will be taking the first British edition as its copy text, but informed by readings of the manuscript, and I hope by things that I've discovered in the archive here in the last couple of weeks. Now, the um, previous World's Classics edition of The First Men in the Moon came out in the 1990s, and it was edited by David Lake, the Australian science fiction writer, whose work some of you might know, and it's actually 
rather, um, you know, off-puttingly, a really good edition. Um, you know, I hope I'm going to find it very helpful, but, you know, you're almost looking for, you know, what can I do to improve on that? So it was useful when I got here on my first day in the archive, and I found something that I wanted to disagree with in Lake's introduction. He points out, I think, quite rightly, that Wells is best known these days for the four great scientific romances that he wrote towards the end of the 19th century. The Time Machine, The Island of Dr. Moreau, The Invisible Man, and the War of the Worlds, and Lake adds to those and said, and you know, along with those, actually, the, you know, the quartet is actually a quintet, it's the first men in the moon, and I think much as one wants to kind of talk up the values and the place of the, the artifact that you're introducing yourself, I, I don't think that's probably right. I think um, that, uh, that, that actually the first the men in the moon is the beginning of something else in, in Wells's career, um, rather than more of something that he was doing um, already. Um, in an article on um, uh, the, a kind of a close reading of the year and a bit of the Strand magazine, uh, which included both the first men in the moon and Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles, um, uh, J.L. Cranfield points out that the reader who took in the first men in the moon in its original form began the novel as a 19th century Victorian and ended it as a 20th century Edwardian. Now, perhaps as literary critics, we are rather over-fond of dealing with, um, with texts uh, you know, in big historical blocks rather than you know, individually one by one, but I do think this shift actually um, is important. As it happens, my last public engagement before this one today was to, uh, to give a, um, a, a closing plenary at the inaugural conference of the very wonderful Edwardian Culture Network um, that came into being this year. I put the web address on your, um, on, on, on your handouts where they asked me to talk about what were the typical characteristics of Edwardian as opposed to Victorian fiction. And I think one finds in the Edwardian period the sense of knowing that it's between epochs, knowing that it's after something great and that the next great thing hasn't come along next. Uh, a discontent, therefore, with the Victorian era's perceived satisfaction. And I think, um, above all, you will find in the fiction of the 1900s <coughs> an urge to find new artistic ways of saying something often expressed through the fantastic, or the, uh, or the nostalgic, or the parodic, or the experimental, or the didactic, I think well, very much you will find is the real theme in 1900s writing of, um, of escape. And I took as my, as my key passage for this, uh, for this, for this earlier lecture, um, Mole deciding to bother housework and running outside into the sunlight um, uh, in The Wind and the Willows. I mean, I, perhaps it's, it's, you know, it's, it's over-milking over it to say that this is the Edwardian flight from the Victorian idealisation of the domestic, but nonetheless you will find lots of different kinds of... I mean, people did get to go outdoors in Victorian writing, but I hope you, you, see, you see my point. That, um, that when I was looking for, you know, what writer sums up the Edwardian, uh, you know, most typically, and I was delighted to find out that it was, of course, H.G. Wells. Um, which justifies me, I think, using this qu next quotation of which I'm, I'm unapologetically over-fond. Since the passing of Victoria the Great, there had been an accumulating uneasiness in the national life. It was as if some compact and dignified paperweight had been lifted from people's ideas, and as if at once they had begun to blow about anyhow. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, it's from a very poor novel, uh, as a lot of uh, Wells' uh, later fiction is, but it's a wonderful uh, image, I think, too, that, that once you have the, kind of the, you know, the death of Queen Victoria, um, whom Wells in his autobiography identifies very closely with his own mother, interestingly enough, but I, I don't have time to talk about that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, that the papers can fly about anywhere. You, know, you, you can say anything, you have, you have much greater freedom. These papers are um, escaping in all kinds of directions, um, even as far as the moon. Um, this period also coincides, Patrick Parander, I think, you know, the, the, the greatest of, of, uh, of, all, of all Wells scholars, suggests that round about the turn of the century, at least as Wells put it in his autobiography, he decided he wasn't going to die. I mean, not die ever, but not die soon. That the great scientific romances, the ones that we remember most, are written when Wells thought that he might, um, he might die prematurely or, or at least be an invalid, and he decides that actually his health improved during that period. And consequently, Wells' politics get a bit more cheerful. He thinks if he's going to live a bit longer, then maybe the prospects for the human race as a whole aren't going to be so bad. And I think um, you know, his, you know, his writing does take uh, you know, a turn um, in that particular direction. I think that's what characterises the fantastic fiction of the 1900s as opposed to the 1890s. So, for instance, when you have The Food of the Gods in 1904 and In the Days of the Comet, 1906, you have the whole world almost spontaneously choosing to adopt the political views of H.G. Wells. 
Um, in the first case, because of the evolution of a race of giant children, um, and in the second, uh, second case, because of a, a, a comet that passes through the atmosphere of the Earth, and everybody goes to sleep and wakes up agreeing with H.G. Wells. I'm, if you've read the novel, you're not, I'm not actually exaggerating. That is, you know, it's a compressed version, but that is pretty much what happens. Um, in the, uh, the War in the Air, on the other hand, perhaps, which I think is, is certainly better than the, the other two books that I've, that I've just mentioned, um, the world uh, doesn't listen to the political ideas of H.G. Wells, and as a consequence, reverts more or less to the, uh, to the, to the Iron Age, that, you know, that, the, that civilization comes to an end. The world itself almost comes to an end in The First Men in the Moon, um, and it, it only does, it, it, and it happens not to, just because of the direction in which the, the Earth's very first piece of Cavorite happens to be pointing. He says, well, actually, I could have ended the world before she was pointing the other way, so instead I've invented this magnificent new element instead that, uh, that resists gravity. Um, if you know the Wells story, um, The Man Who Could Work Miracles, too, you'll know that's another image of the world almost being ended by a kind of excess of uh, utopian um, wish, wish fulfilment. Uh, it's very interesting to see the place that, that luck plays in Wells's um, uh, scientific romances. I mean, he's often, he's often wrongly thought of um, you know, uh, as being this kind of unthinking technocrat, you know, that science is great and knowledge is great and if we were just kind of more scientifically, um, you know, if we just gave everything up to science, then everything would be great. I mean, you know, Wells doesn't think that. In fact, um, George Orwell um, wrote a late essay where he portrays Wells as being a technocrat. And Wells famously wrote him a technocrat, uh, wrote him a, a very short telegram saying, read my early work, you shit. Um, so Wells clearly did not think of himself as being this kind of, you know, wholehearted, 100% technocrat. And actually, dumb luck plays a large part in such scientific progress and discovery as is uh, accomplished in his, um, in, his, in his fantastic fiction. Um, but nonetheless, okay, so um, you, will, you will get a kind of, you know, a, a kind of greater reach of the fantastic and a turn even more towards politics in Wells' fantastic writing of the 1900s. Now, of course, this is there all along. I remember teaching The Time Machine, the very first of his scientific romances, with my undergraduate class in Durham. And I said, what do you think? And one student said, um, well, I found The Time Machine a bit didactic, a bit heavy-handed. And I said, oh, my boy, you know, if only you should see what's coming after in terms of you know, the tone of, um, of, 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 of Wells' of Wells's writing. But I do think Wells, is, he's doing something very particular in the 1900s romances and in uh, The First Men in the Moon. G.K. Chesterton thought that the giant children uh, in The Food of the Gods were a kind of authorial projection of Wells himself. He says, the thing about H.G. Wells, you can lie awake at night and listen to him growing. Um, <laughs> the giant children could rule the world better than the existing structures of government because they can see further, because they have this stratospheric perspective on the earth, and they can read it uh, as we might, um, uh, you know, a map. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this, that if you're looking at the earth from the moon, then you can see, perhaps, um, even further, as Cavour puts it, we are out of Mother Earth's leading strings now. Uh, the, the, the journey that Cavour and Bedford take to the moon gives them a superior perspective um, on the Earth. When it's viewed from the Cavourite sphere, on the, on the journey from the Earth to the moon, the Earth seems smaller and less relevant to Bedford. He says, for a moment I could never believe that there was a world. Think of that incredibly famous photo of, of, of the Earth. It's the first photo of the Earth when, uh, when, when seen from orbit. Uh, this is foreseen, so many things are foreseen, in H.G. Wells, in The First Men in the Moon. And Bedford says, Those who have only seen the starry sky from the Earth cannot imagine its appearance when the vague, half-luminous veil of our air has been withdrawn. The stars we see on Earth are the mere scattered survivors that penetrate our misty atmosphere, but now at last I could realise the meaning of the hosts of heaven. Wells is often, I think, a more lyrical writer than he's given um, credit for being. So the fantastic for Wells gives you a new point of view. And this is a phrase that, that there's a chapter called Points of View in The First Men in the Moon. And um, uh, at one point, Cavour describes himself as being effervescing with new ideas and, um, and, 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 and points of view. You can even experience your own body differently. Uh, in the fantastic, when you're travelling in, in space, in the um, uh, in, in the first man in the moon. So you know you you experience everything differently. The way you look at things, the way you look at the world, um, and uh, I think it's something that's it, you know, it's not unique to Wells. That it's it's common to a, a number of like, you know wonderful moon books that I've got the privilege of being surrounded by as I uh, as as I talk to you here. That uh, things that the, the notion of 
things looking different from up there, that the Earth uh, looks different uh, when seen uh, from the moon, as when, um, you know, you know uh, depending on, um, um, so this is very flash, and depending on which version of the book you're reading, whether you're reading, you know, the, the book that's out there in the rest of the world, or the manuscript of the first men in the moon that's in this room and nowhere else, whether it's Cavour or Cavour and Bedford describing the Earth to, um, to, the, to, to, the, to the Selenites, that, you know, the aspects of Earth culture start to look absurd, or ridiculous when described to someone that's never seen them um, up close, only from this uh, from this lunar perspective. Um, so um, Wells is used to the fantastic, and again, he's you know he's not unique in this, but I think Wells does it in a, in a particularly interesting way. Is he's looking to break to disrupt habits of perception. One gets into habits of mind. Cavour confesses, uh, and uh, Wells is looking to break. Um, ha habits of mind. As Arnold Bennett put it in his review of First Men in the Moon, here, in the guise of romance, is a serious criticism of life. And those of you that have engaged in the academic study of science fiction will have come, have come across this um, idea all the time. Just another couple of, of, of brief uh, quotations. Science fiction, um, according to Darko Suvin, is wiser than the world it speaks to. The presence of the fantastic indicates not a departure from reality, but a perspective facing in from outside it. Well, Frederick Jameson claims that um, one, of the most, uh, one of the most significant potentialities of science fiction as a form is precisely this capacity to provide something like an experimental variation on our own empirical universe. Fant the fantastic seeks to defamiliarize and to restructure our experience of our own present. Gulliver's Travels, for example, turns extreme anti-utopian despair into a critique of the anti-utopian world which it mirrors. For some of you, this, this will remind you of, of, of um, what the Russian formalist school uh, does when writing about the fantastic and, uh, and, and, and writing um, about Swift in particular, which uh, I won't read it out, but I put the quotation from Tomaszewski on, um, on, on Gulliver's Travels. It says that, you know, that when Gulliver is trying to, to explain war, class strife, and parliamentary intrigue to a, waste, uh, to a race of, you know, of much wiser and more intelligent horses that, you know, that these things, you know, start to look pretty, pretty stupid. Um, and um, this is, you know, this, this is what Wells is doing too. I mean, in fact, he writes in a 1931 preface to the
there and see if it looks different. Um, as Paul Simon puts it, if you will pardon me, but it's a Friday afternoon. <laughs> if you want to write a song about the human race, write a song about the moon. I found it really interesting, looking at the other exhibits here, how prevalent the notion of satire was in moon narrative. This, is, this, is, this, this seems to be the first genre that, uh, you know, that, that, that comes to hand for writers across the ages and across different cultures that you will write satire. Write from Lucian onwards, and it's great to see uh, uh, Lucian in this exhibition. It was a real surprise to me because um, Wells was so absolutely antipathetic to the notion um, of the classics that if there's one positive mention of Latin or Greek literature in his text, there's 50 negative ones. I mean, particularly in his relationship with, um, with George Gissing, whom I'm sorry I was going to have to mention at some point. Um, uh, but uh, that, that, you know, he thinks that, you know, that the, as the classics as being, a, a, being an obstruction of the human mind, that, you know, that the great minds of... You know, the next generation are, you know, are learning Greek verses, whether, you know, how to make Greek verses, where they should be learning, you know, how to make, you know, engineering or, you know, or things like that. But nonetheless, um, a, uh, right from the very beginning of the composition of The First Men in the Moon, uh, Wells begins uh, with uh, his epigraph from, uh, from, uh, from, from Lucian. That, that, that it, was, it was, Wells wants to make this homage almost as soon as he has the idea uh, for, this, for this book at all, which I think is, is, is fascinating. And, uh, you know, Lucian is, of course, writing satire. More specifically, he is writing uh, Menippean satire. Uh, I claim absolutely no authority for making any judgment at all about the genre of, uh, of Latin literature, but um, I'm only familiar with this term through uh, the reading of it in, um, in Bakhtin, who I think is a really interesting theorist to use to look at this kind of material. And I've just put some of Bakhtin's notions of what characterises Menippean satire on your, um, on your sheet that we have here. Testing philosophical truth, especially through the manipulation of fantastic. You have the combination of the symbolic and uh, slum naturalism, the realistic. You certainly have that in Wells. Um, that you have broad philosophical reflections, spheres of heaven, earth, and hell, an unusual point of view, social utopia, variety of other genres. The book, uh, the such a satire is multi-toned and is concerned with with um, with current topics. And um, Bakhtin uh, finds these qualities in writers such, uh, that he admires, such as Dostoevsky. But I think you can identify these characteristics as being shared by you know, Lucian at, at, at one end and by um, H.G. Wells on the other. So if uh, The First Men in the Moon is satirical, if it's parodic, uh, what is he sending up? Well, firstly, obviously, I think he's sending up, standing, uh, sending up the adventure story. Now, I know I've just said a moment ago that, you know, that the genre of this book is satire, and I'm suggesting that the genre of it is adventure <laughs> story as well, but I think that is very much how Wells um, approaches, um, approaches genre. He has a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a very mixed notion of genre. So, for instance, his earlier book, The Wheels of Chance, is, I think, both at the same time, parodic, chivalric romance, but it's also this rather gr grimly realistic tale of the limited um, economic opportunity opportunities available to a junior draper in the late 19th century. You, you ha if you haven't, you know, you'll have to read it to believe me, if you, know, if you haven't read it already, but I think it, you know, it's, it, is, it, is, it is both of those things. And I think um, The First Men in the Moon occupies multiple genres uh, simultaneously too. Um, it's a book, uh, as a number of the other moon narratives uh, you know, do as well, that, that, that it seems to know what sort of book it is. It's very self-conscious, I think, and seems to um, speak in the knowledge of the other moon books as well. So, um, you know, Ke uh, both Kepler and Verne are mentioned in uh, The First Men in the Moon um, it, it, it's itself, too. Wells worked really, really hard on the tone of, um, of the first man in the moon. I think this is how he pulls it off in the wheels of chance as well, too, that the, um, that, that, uh, that, you know, the tone of voice is extremely careful about when it's sincere, about when it's, about when it's ironic, that you do have a lot of modulations of the, of the tone of voice um, in, in this text. And that's one of the things that Wells is working hardest at in the, in the different versions of the manuscript revisions. Um, handily, uh, very, very early on in the material held here, there's a note to self across one of the manuscript sheets that says, um, uh, make Bedford a much more brutal person with an initial contempt for Cavour. So as, as he works at it, he is, he is you know, focusing the, you know, the, the tone of Bedford, who becomes less fool and more knave in each version of, of the text as, as Wells uh, writes it. Uh, for instance, let's look at, uh, at the next passage. Um, 
The absent-mindedness that had just escaped depopulating the terrestrial globe might at any moment result in some other grave inconvenience. On the other hand, I was young, my affairs were in a mess, and I was just in the mood for reckless adventure with a chance of something good at the end of it. So you have this kind of very characteristically, you know, English ironic, you know, describing, you know, the end of the Earth's atmosphere as a, a you know, as a grave inconvenience, and then you have this, what the hell, kind of strand magazine, uh, you know, um, gung ho. Now, you really do get a sense of the first men in the moon as an adventure story when you read it in its serial parts uh, in the in the strand magazine, which you can do um, uh, online via the uh, the Happy Trust. Uh, rep repository too, but um, it feels much more like an adventure story read, read in its, its parts. Even even if you sit and read it in one sitting, in its parts, just you know knowing where the, where the divisions fall. So those of you that, um, uh, that that know the text, where Bedford turns around at one point and says, "Do you know where the sphere is?" You know they've, they've got they've got to the moon. They're leaping around and says, "Where's the sphere?" That's not just the end of a chapter. That's the end of a monthly part. So it's you know tune in next month uh, to you know to see how our, our heroes deal with it. You also get a sense of reading it uh, in these parts of what else is going on in the Strand magazine besides the first men in the moon. So um, uh, part one is followed in the Strand by an article on Beckles Wilson called The Evolution of Our Map. It's then followed by a very conventional adventure story, then by an Arctic piece, Further North than Nansen. I mean, how kind of you know, late Victoria does that sound? <laughs> um, but, you know, Bedford does say at one point in the first men in the moon, to go into outer space is not so much worse, if at all, than a polar expedition. Men go on polar expeditions. But you have the kind of, you know, the proof of that, you know, elsewhere within the volume that's, that's, that you have in your hands. Um, and then that's followed in turn by um, a, a, a humorous piece called To Have and To Hold. But it's not just uh, fiction and non-fiction in the Strand magazine, you also have more political pieces too. So an article on Peace Heroes of 1900, that this seems much more aligned with the, uh, with the Wellsian programme, uh, and a piece on the building of the battleship, the Deutschland. Uh, I also found, uh, you know, within the sequence that includes these serial parts, uh, an article on uh, the, modern, the modern Russian officer, which starts with the very Wellsian sentiment that a large part of the intellectual world hoped that with the dawn of the 20th century, reason and not mere brute force would be the arbiter in differences between nations as between individuals. Well, if you know about you know, Wells' attitude towards world peace, or if you've read uh, the descriptions of war within the text, then you know, that, 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 will, that passage you know, should, um, should, uh, you know, should, should, should chime uh, with you. So um, I think it's something that more and more people are doing in literary studies at the moment, that you're, um, you know, the, that you're reading a text in its periodical context and just seeing what other meanings get produced. But those other meanings do get produced. You do start to see that text uh, in a new light. And digitization, of course, does make that kind of thing uh, a bit easier. Also, I think, Wells is engaging with, possibly even satirising, his own work up to that point. In fact, even his own work that he hadn't got round to writing just yet. Uh, Bennett, Bennett's review also points out that Wells' uh, work is at least as diverse as that of any other living prose writer. And it's difficult to kind of, you know, look in 1900 and, and, and say, you know, who, who else that might, uh, that might possibly be. Wells is, in a sense, he's telling a story that he's already told a couple of times beforehand, but from the other way around. That both uh, the wonderful visit and the sea lady are the stories of um, a visitor, a fantastic visitor from, from outside of that community, just <coughs> the respectively, an angel and a sea lady turn up in these rather staid British communities with you know, um, you know, surprising consequences. And of course what's happening here is, is the other way around. This time it's the humans that are, that are the fantastic visitors, and it's the Selenites that are the well-composed community. And at one point Bedford says, well, God, I mean, you know, how would we think if, you know, you know the, we were these two strange hairy visitors? What are they going to make of us? How would we feel if these two aliens suddenly appeared in the, in the, middle, of, uh, in the middle of Hyde Park? So, you know, he, you know, he, he, he knows that he's, he's, he's going over some of the, the same ground, but in um, a different way. Um, the other text that I've been working on while I've been here is, is The Time Machine. And uh, in The Time Machine, the adventurer descends below ground and has, um, uh, you know, and a, a, you know a, as it turns out, violent encounter with the strange creatures that live beneath the surface of there, the Earth, here, the Moon. But there's clearly a similarity here, too. Um, in both cases, there's a, a sudden lust for violence on the part of the central character. I saw Scarlet, as the saying is, as, as, as Bedford puts it. Um, in both texts, you have the temporary loss of the fantastic means of transport, 
the time machine and the Kavorite sphere, both go missing at each point in the story. And they're both, of course, imperial satires at the same time, too. Uh, at one point, too, uh, Bedford notices as they're speeding off to the moon that they are invisible to other human beings, even by telescope. And that, I think, immediately uh, reminds me, at least, of the opening of The War of the Worlds, where um, uh, Wells' narrator imagines the Martians looking down at the Earth through their superior telescopes. And at one point, uh, Bedford and Gore said, we don't have to go to the moon, we could go, we could go to Mars. And of course, any Wells reader would say, no, no, no don't, don't go to Mars, they've got Martians there, they've got you know, tripods and heat rays and everything. <laughs> um, and even the super adaptation of selenites such as Fayou and the Grand Luna, who have these uh, enormous pulsating um, um, brains, uh, recall uh, an H.G. Wells essay called um, Of a Book Unwritten, in his book uh, of certain, certain Personal Matters, where Wells tries to imagine what humanity will look like in millions and millions of years of evolution, where he says, well, you know, what's really great about humans? We've got these terrific brains and we've got these opposable thumbs. So he imagines, you know, if we keep evolving the way we do, we're going to have bigger brains and we're going to have, you know, bigger hands and more efficient digestive systems. Um, <laughs> most importantly, I think, the book of his own that Wells is reworking in The First Men of the Moon is the book that, and I haven't had time to check this, but I think it's about right, the book that immediately preceded it, which is Anticipations. And it's Wells' first book of utopian and political speculation. And I said uh, earlier on that, you know, the Wells is best known now for the early scientific romances. Until World War I, Wells is, I wouldn't say most popular, but certainly his best-selling book, was not any of the fiction books, but it was this one. It was, it, was, it was Anticipations. Now, Anticipations begins by talking about transport. Uh, you know, Wells is, is obsessed with, with modes of transport, and, he, and uh, he talks about the modern abolition of distance. Um, you know, it, well, the thing, is, I mean, the thing about Wells is that he could take you know, you know, almost any aspect of, you know, of a history or science or culture and says, and therefore we conclude that we should have a world government. Um, uh, he says, but because the fact that we can... Um, that uh, transport is much quicker and much more effective, you know, the distance being abolished, you know, we're all brought close to each other, we all need to get along, and therefore we should have a system of utopian uh, world government rather than, you know, for keeping to, uh, to, 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 to nation states. Wells, I think, is at his best when he's writing with some sense of negative capability, when he's writing outside himself, when he, is, when he puts forward a certain program um, in anticipations, and then he mildly mocks it in the book that follows, in, in, the, in the First Men in the Moon. Uh, later on, in his absolute, you know, he's enormous. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, I, I, sorry, I do tend to wave my arms around when I'm, um, when I'm lecturing, as my students will tell you, but th there's, a, there's a point to this gesture, but I would say Wells' enormous subsequent output, he's sort of, he's enormous, uh, over there, the other side of that door, uh, you know, the, the um, you know, 150 books and pamphlets that Wells would write over the course of his career, the diet, he loses that sense, I think, of negative capability, and you know, and everything becomes, you know, you know, put through the frame of this particular politics. But I think uh, in the early 1900s, Wells is still um, is still playing um, with this um, uh, with this stuff. So he has a, a particular political program that he's beginning to adumbrate in anticipations, and the fantastic allows him to break through the existing structures for him to articulate it and to see it or to put it in a particular way. My next quotation um, is not from one of the fantastic Edwardian texts, it's from the history of Mr. Polly, but I think it puts it really well. But when a man has once broken through the paper walls of everyday circumstance, those unsubstantial walls that hold so many of us securely prisoned from the cradle to the grave, he has made a discovery. If the world does not please you, you can change it. Determine to alter it at any price, and you can change it altogether. You may change it to something sinister and angry, something appalling, but it may be you will change it to something brighter, something more agreeable, and at the worst, something much more interesting. Well, Wells says that in a book that comes out in 1910, and I think that's what he's doing with his uh, fantastic, fantastic writing in the, um, in the decade beforehand, that um, he has these imaginative world-building um, you know, pro projects. This, the, the title of my lecture I borrow from experiment in autobiography, of course, you know, the idea of a planned world. And that's just what the first men in the moon is, um, is, 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 is presenting. And I think while, um, in some senses, the, the society presented on the moon is absolutely ghastly, at least a part of Wells finds it really appealing. This is a passage uh, deleted from the book that we find in the manuscript. That world of perfect reasonableness into whose tranquil depths we two earth creatures had fallen as stones splash into quiet waters. 
In this world, save as rational appetite, there was no hunger and no thirst, never were there any vicious propensities or any aching anxieties, neither violence nor conflicts of opinions, nor cruel stress of competition, nor unwilling labour, nor war. I think there's a part of Wells that's thinking, well, that's not so bad, is it? <laughs> uh, but again, it's the kind of careful modulations of the, of the, of the irony in, um, in Bedford's tone of voice. This is another manuscript passage. Uh, the church catechism pleads vain, uh, vainly for men to do their duty in that state of life into which they are called. But in this blue world within the moon, that struggle is over. Per a perfect reason has won. And from his birth onwards, the Selenite knows his place and duty. There are no unemployed... No educated proletariat to foment discontent. No rivalries and competitions. The moon is a state of social perfection. And that's beginning to sound a bit less utopian and a bit more dystopian, um, I, I think. You know, and so Wells is definitely, you know, he, because I think it's relevant that these are deleted passages, I think Wells is trying to see how far he can push it in either, well, in fact, in both directions at once, in the, you know, the ironic level and, and, and at the level of, um, of advocacy too. Now, some of you will have recognised uh, the uh, Shakespeare quotation that I gave earlier on because it, it gave uh, Vladimir Nabokov the title for one of his novels. And uh, Wells scholarship does have its own Charles Kinboat uh, in the shape of another editor of The First Men in the Moon with whom I'm going to disagree, uh, Leon Stover, who has suggested, um, as I think I depart from in Maps of Utopia, the absolute continuity of all of Wells' work from the beginning to the end. And he says it's, it's, it's everything is, a, is a, an articulation of this programme that Stover, although not Wells, calls Wellsism, that Stover sees as developing from the work of one man, uh, Le Comte de Saint-Simon. Although there aren't many references to Saint-Simon in Wells, although that doesn't stop Stover. Have a look at Stover's editions of Wells' scientific romances if you're, if you're interested. So I, I think he's... Uh, th there's something in that, though. I think he's got hold of the wrong book but there might be something that Wells is actually articulating uh, repeatedly throughout his career. Um, and uh, that book is Plato's Republic, which Wells uh, describes in his autobiography as providing him with the amazing and heartening suggestion that the whole fabric of law, custom and worship, which seems so invincibly established, might be cast into the melting pot and made anew. Um, I think... Uh, while it's in, in some ways dystopian, I think the society portrayed of the moon is in some ways utopian as well, and I think it's an image of Plato's Republic. Uh, there is a mention of Plato in the manuscript that gets deleted from the, uh, from the book because I think Wells realises that he's riding a hobby horse rather than you know, creating something strictly within um, the world of, of, that, um, of that book. But, um, I, I, I'm, of course, I shouldn't assume that everybody has necessarily read the book, but... Um, uh, in the moon, every Selenite is perfectly physically adapted to the, to the role they play. So whatever job you have will determine your particular body shape. Um, so, you know, all, the, you know all, all shepherds look like, you know, a particular way. The, you know, the, the, the rulers of the earth have these, uh, have these, have these massive brains. Uh, that there is um, a, a Selenite that's a kind of um, punker waller, that, that all he does is he, he operates a fan. Um, and uh, he is perfectly biologically adapted to do that and to do nothing else. You know, no spare biological capacity is wasted on this menial worker of a, um, of a Selenite to give him a brain left over to be unhappy with doing such a trivial task because he has just enough brain to do that task and, um, and, and, and nothing more. But for Wells, I think this has the kind of ironic advantage that um, basically in humanity, you know, we're, we're adapted to do lots of different things and it makes us more or less biologically the same and it makes us unhappy because so many of us don't fit the roles that society puts us into. In the moon, everything, everyone is, is, perfectly, uh, is perfectly suited to what they do. And Wells writes a version of Plato's Republic a few years after The First Men in the Moon in A Modern Utopia, where he imagines that everybody gets exactly the education that they require to allow them to develop to their particular uh, social uh, role and, and, that's, and, and whatever society has need of. He never quite says how what an individual wants and what a society wants for an individual are squared up. But it is, you know, a utopian text, and he just imagines that, you know, um, you, you, know you don't have frustrated junior drapers, uh, you know, that, that really want to be, to be writers or, or politicians, that, you know, that, that uh, you know, the body and ambition and individual will and education and social role are all fitted together 
and you have a sketch of Wells's modern utopia uh, in the um, in in the world um, in the world of the moon here, which contrasts decidedly with the disordered world portrayed in the first men in the moon. There's not uh, much of economic thought in the first men in the moon, but you know, but but there is some. Uh, the main character Bedford is an undischarged bankrupt. In other words, he suffers from a severe case of what Plato would call pleonexia, wanting to have more than your fair share. Um, Cavour has uh, three workmen helping him build this magical new element called Cavourite, who are not only incompetent, but they've all been sacked from their previous jobs in which they were trained to do something else. I mean, it just shows how messed up we have the distribution of abilities and, uh, and labour and social organisation in the earth compared to the moon, where, albeit in a really horrifying, scaring way, that way, they have got it right, at least to a degree. I think the moon creatures are designed to provoke contradictory responses on the part um, of, of the reader. So, for instance, um, Cavour sees um, uh, you know, a drone just you know, like that and says, well, what's up? Is, you know, is he on his break, whatever? And, uh, and his interpreter say, no, 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 when we have surplus drones uh, that we don't need, we just put them into a state of suspended animation until they're needed again. And Cavour thinks, oh my God, you know, that's really, that's really horrible, but then wonders if actually having unemployed, starving workers walking the streets is actually any more kind or cruel uh, by comparison. Uh, there's also this wonderful passage, which I'm afraid I've, I've, it's poorly formatted in your, on your sheet, so this was haste um, this morning, where they see a selenite while it's still squishy, being formed into the social body that it's, that it's, uh, that it's going to occupy. That wretched-looking hand tentacle sticking out of its jar seemed to have a sort of limp appeal for lost possibilities. It haunts me still, although, of course, it is really, in the end, a far more humane proceeding than our earthly method of leaving children to grow into human beings and then making machines of them. Uh, so I should begin to draw towards uh, the close of, uh, of The First Men in the Moon and the close of my, um, uh, of my talk, too. Wells, I see Wells in, in, uh, in Maps of Utopia as being, um, in some ways, Cassandra. You know, he is a, you know, a prophet who gets more and more fed up by the fact that he keeps predicting the future correctly and nobody believes him. And he's also Moses, too. He is um, uh, you know, bringing the, you know, the, the, the tablets down from the mountain, saying this is the truth, these are the, the, the rules that we have, to, uh, we have to live by. He's also, in some ways, the grand Luna, who is you know, the big brain that rules the whole of the, um, of, of the moon. This is what a couple of Wells critics have cheekily suggested, that if you have this image of a perfect society, and you have one being that has a much bigger brain than everybody else and knows exactly how things should be run, who could that be an image of? Um, you know, the grand Luna says, you know, what, you have no grand earthly? It's like, no, 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 but we have, we have H.G. Wells. Um, <laughs> He's also, uh, I think what gives him the authority to do this is he is the prisoner that has escaped from Plato's cave. And I, I, I think as time is pressing, I won't read out the passage from the Republic that I've put on the sheet, but, but uh, Plato says that once you have you know, broken, th bro you know, broken through these paper walls, as, as Wells puts it, once you can, you, know, you can see things correctly, you can see uh, the, the stars and the moon and the sun really as they are, rather than just seeing their, uh, their, their, pale, um, uh, their pale reflections. Um, I did want to talk a little about the ending of The First Men in the Moon because uh, this is, uh, I think we can, we can learn from it by looking at the manuscript um, here. Um, initially, uh, Wells had both Cavour and Bedford um, escape uh, from, the, from the moon. What happens for about two-thirds, three-quarters um, of, of the manuscript is that they are both captured by the Selenites uh, they are taken to the uh, underground sea that's beneath the surface of the moon and then to the moon's central city, Tycho, named after uh, the, 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 the astro astronomer royal, where they are interviewed by the, by the Grand Lunar and um, Cavour tells the Grand Lunar um, about war because he's really in favour. He thinks the British Empire, it's marvellous, we've got steam power all over the world and we've done it through war, which is, which is splendid. Um, and um, Sorry, it's, it's Bedford who says that, and it's Cavour who lets slip that he is the only person on the earth that knows how to make Cavourite, this gravity-resisting metal that allows moon travel. So the Grand Luna says, well, in which case there is no, no way, you know, you, you two are not escaping, because uh, we've, heard, we've heard about war and we don't want it to come anywhere near the earth. Um, for almost all of the versions of, um, of, 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 the, of the book that, um, uh, uh, that you'll find in the manuscript, Cavour and Bedford kind of make a run for it. Um, they run to the sphere, um, they 
go down into the depths of this lunar sea, where Wells always intended them to have some kind of encounter with a crake and monster beast, but I, I haven't found any uh, intention that he, that he got round to writing it, because I think he was losing faith in the ending. And they both get back to Earth uh, with, uh, with the gold that they've stolen from the, um, from, from, from the moon, but they never go back um, to, the, uh, to the moon, because the, uh, the sphere is stolen by a small boy in Kent, and the journey to, um, I, there's more I can say about this, but I'm running out of time. Um, and they never repeat the journey to the moon because uh, the effect of, of going to the moon has been too much for Cavour, the inventor, and, and he loses his wits, he loses his mind. And uh, there are different versions of it where Bedford says, well, I'm waiting for Cavour to get better so that we can go back to the moon, we can go back in a bigger sphere with, with guns. Um, but, but there's no sign of that happening. Also, um, in this original version, uh, Bedford gets married, too, um, to a very nice lady. He doesn't seem in any particular hurry to get back to me. So, you know, I hope we can go back, but in the meantime, I'll just enjoy my estate here in Amalfi and the, and the sunshine and my lovely wife. So, you know, eventually we'll go back to the moon. Almost at the last minute, uh, Wells changes his mind. And I think there are, there are, you know, there are some reasons for preferring the original ending, but, but Wells knew what he was, he was doing, and I think I'll just briefly say why, and then I'll... Um, and, then, and, then I'll, and then I'll stop. Um, when you're reading it in the Strand, this, it's clear that, that, that the Strand had already started serialising the first men in the moon by the time Wells had his final idea for the ending, because you get to what looks like the serial part, and then it says, stop press, you know, tune in next month, and we have uh, you know, further shocking revelations to make about the moon. What Wells does in the, in the ending that we have now is that, uh, is that Bedford gets away, the, uh, the adventurer, uh, and Cavour, uh, the inventor, uh, is captured by the Selenites, and he broadcasts his image, his um, uh, his views of the moon to the uh, to the to the earth until he is um, silenced or dies, or we never know. And I think that's a much that's a much better ending. Wells really liked leaving his scientific romances, and you would think of them as being the most programmatic or the most didactic, but they've all got the most um, extraordinary endings. If you think about the ending of the time of the time machine where we're left, the, the time traveller disappears, we don't know where to, and we're left with Wiener's two flowers that seem to be unclassifiable within any Earth order. Um, the Martians are killed at the end of the War of the Worlds, and uh, the narrator tells that, that the Earth scientists don't know what to do with the Martian technology um, and the bodies, that you know, we never know, are they going to invade again? We can't say. Best of all, I think, in The Invisible Man, we have Griffin's notebooks, uh, illegible to the tramp who inherits them, weather-worn and tinged with an algal green. For once they sojourned in a ditch, and some of the pages have been washed by dirty water. So I think whenever Wells wants writes a fantastic text, he, he, he never wants to push the explanation to the, to the fullest extent, so you always have to kind of write in the gaps of that, um, of that text yourself. That the last broadcast that comes from the moon in the version that we have is U-L-E-S-S. -S. And Cabor says, I don't know what that means. Now, if you've worked on H.G. Wells' handwriting, the idea of looking at a word in a Wells text and not being able to read it or not know, or not know what it means is an extremely common one. So for me, at least, that seems like a, you know, an entirely appropriate for that being the, the, last, the last broadcast from the moon. But I think I'll just point with the, the, I think with the, uh, with the, with the, the words with which Wells decided he was going to close the first men in the moon. Just at this point, unhappily, this message broke off. Fragmentary and tantalising as the matter constituting its chapter is, it does nevertheless give a vague, broad impression of an altogether strange and wonderful world, a world with which our own may have to reckon sooner or later. This intermittent trickle of messages, this whispering of a record needle in the stillness of the mountain slopes, is the first warning of such a change in human conditions as mankind has scarcely imagined heretofore. In that satellite of ours, there are new elements, new appliances, traditions, an overwhelming avalanche of new ideas. Thank you all very much.